Now I, I'd like to turn uh, our uh, conversation to anti-angiogenics agents. Uh, this has been an area where uh, there was a huge amount of enthusiasm in the 90s and, and uh, at the turn of the millennium with uh, anti-angiogenic therapy being very successful in preclinical models and certainly as it entered into the clinic also in colorectal cancer. Uh, yet in breast cancer we uh, have not been able to prove uh, the holy grail of survival advantage. Now granted there are many anti-angiogenic agents that are now coming out that have different mechanisms of action, but Joyce, wh where, where are we now? What, what is the patient that would receive the one approved uh, anti-angiogenic bevacizumab and, and what, what are the prospects for some of the newer agents? So fortunately, the um, Meridian trial is ongoing, so we have a really important hypothesis, which is the plasma VEGFA levels. Thank goodness there's a um, good assay now for the ligand that um, bevacizumab actually binds to, because it makes sense there that perhaps cancers that produce more or in the setting, the microenvironment setting of higher VEGFA levels, you'll get more benefit from bevacizumab versus the cancers that make low levels. And there's certainly some retrospective data from Avado um, so, and, and several, several other trials. So patients are being stratified by plasma VEGFA, low or high on the meridian, then receive the weekly paclitaxel plus minus. And so, for example, triple negative breast cancers have, have high plasma VEGFA levels in general, and more indolent breast cancers have lower. So, so that's, um, that's good. That's very, very good that we're going to get a nice answer you know, on that, I still do utilize the bevacizumab, particularly in patients with triple negative breast cancer who have not done well with, um, have not had a long disease-free interval from their adjuvant chemotherapy who, who displayed a fair amount of chemotherapy resistance. Um, you know, I do utilize bevacizumab still in those patients with pac paclitaxel. The um, serafinib is, is also in a big phase three trial with capecitabine plus minus, you know, because the randomized phase two looked quite promising. And serafinib hits VEGFR, you know, the receptor, but also hits um, RAS-RAF and to some extent PDGFR, et cetera. So that's a very interesting agent that will be interesting to see how that um, phase three pans out. Hand-foot syndrome was a bit of a challenge there. And then the Aveo drug, tavozinib, you know, which is a VEGFR one, two, three inhibitor, also an oral a VEGFR inhibitor is, um, uh, I think, going to go into a frontline trial in triple negative breast cancer patients with the weekly paclitaxel plus minus, you know, approach because the um, serafinib and I think um, uh, Bill, you were involved with a um, paclitaxel, paclitaxel, serafinib, and serafinib. What yeah. was the results on that? Well, that that was meant to mimic E2100, and it did in design, but not in results, and therein lies the rub. So there was some improvement in outcome, but we found that patients, because of where the trial was conducted, were having a lot of toxicity and some very unusual side effects. I think where they're putting their emphasis on approval, hopefully, is with the Cape Cytobine trial that you mentioned. If the hand-foot syndrome can be better controlled and the doses were modified to achieve that. So we'll see. So as we look ahead uh, in this area, there, there are some uh, other agents that um, have been under investigation that have received a lot of attention, for example, PARP inhibitors, uh, particularly uh, perhaps in BRCA-related cancers or I should say DNA repair deficient cancers, uh, a variety of other um, uh, kinase inhibitors and immunoconjugates not necessarily geared towards HER2. Bill, do you, do you have a comment on, on some of these agents or, or some that you feel are, are um, particularly promising to move forward? Well, I think the PARP inhibitors still have a lot of promise. I think, and Joyce is intimately familiar with this because a lot of the enthusiasm around PARP inhibitors really came from that first trial that uh, you presented with uh, chemo versus chemo plus PARP in, in the subset of patients. But I think the instructive thing was when this, the, the phase three trial was done, we weren't seeing precisely the same enthusiasm with the results. And I think you nicely made the point in your discussion when you presented that data that you know tr all triple negative is not the same. And I think part of the issue is we have to be smarter than simply looking at ERPR and HER2 to figure out really what's driving an individual cancer. And I think once we do that, once we have a better understanding, clearly, as you pointed out, the patients that have BRCA mutations, even with monotherapy with uh, at least one PARP inhibitor, seem to be uh, particularly sensitive. Uh, but that's not true of all the PARP inhibitors, and it's probably going to make a difference what their partner is. 
you know, there are certain drugs that seem to have synergy with, of all drugs, temozolomide in breast cancer, which is a combination we would never think would be a reasonable thing to do. So I think the bottom line with respect to PARP inhibitors, we probably had to take a several steps back, but I think that is still going to go forward. We'll ultimately probably figure out who benefits. There are other drugs. We talked a little bit about immunoconjugates earlier, and there are such drugs that are being developed, hopefully, for triple negative disease. I think triple negative disease or basal type tumors are still, we're looking for the target. We don't have the target clearly uh, yet identified that we can, um, that's druggable, that we've been effectively able to develop an agent successfully for. And I think you bring up a very good point with the uh, hybrid molecules, uh, in particular the um, glenbatumumab vedatin, which is um, targeting GPNMB, which is a transmembrane glycoprotein, which promotes invasion and migration, and it's linked to a chemotherapy drug because it appears that triple negative breast cancers do uh, have more GPNMB, and there was a randomized phase two, which will be presented at San Antonio, but it's out in the public domain, in which uh, patients who had more than 25% GPNMB, either in the tumor, the epithelial component of the tumor, or the stroma, uh, they had response rates, which were 37% versus that of investigator's choice. So it, it really makes you think that it is probably a good target for triple negative breast cancer. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. That was a CDX yeah. 011 CDX drug, 011, and, uh, yeah. uh, we look forward to hearing about that. And, and Joyce, getting back to the PARP inhibitor, yeah, the Aniparib data was uh, v very exciting, and uh, still, even in the phase three, did show some some benefit in the uh, uh, second and third line mm -hmm. patients. And we now know that Aniparib may not be the strongest PARP inhibitor, although it does have some DNA damaging uh, capability. But uh, can you tell us where uh, that drug is going and what what investigations are going on in that area? Yes, there's been an extensive evaluation, biomarker analysis, and there'll be some data coming out and some publications about the huge amount of work. But there, it, it still does appear that in the setting of potentially um, DNA repair deficits, double strand deficits, as well as uh, some of the cancers that may be sensitive to killing by reactive oxygen species, that there may be a subset there, as you point out, it's really, really key to find out which patients and to develop a signature that uh, points you in the direction. But for example, you know, it may be that patients who receive frontline chemotherapy, that those um, cancers that uh, persist after that frontline may be more sensitive to agents such as aniparib that may really interfere with that whole ROS, um, reactive oxygen species, redox signaling. So. Um, there's, it's very interesting. I um, am hopeful that there will be a subsequent trial that looks, um, looks at those hypotheses in, and particularly in the second, third line setting. So those, you know, those kinds of conversations are definitely ongoing. You know, it's um, interesting to speculate that at the end of the day, we may not be so interested whether you've got a BRCA mutation or an ATM mutation or a CHECK1 mutation. It may be that we need some more global uh, profiling of double-strand DNA repair problems, et cetera, to be able to choose patients who may benefit from PARP inhibitors, for example, real PARP inhibitors, because the really isn't um, potent enough against PARP to be really a PARP inhibitor. But like Kathy Miller's looking at Rucaparib, you know, the Clovis PARP inhibitor in, it's just a um, pilot trial, 120 patients, triple negative breast cancer, no pathologic complete response looking at um, cisplatin with or without rucaparib, you know, to take a, take a look. Again, there some assay looking at patients who appear to have double strand DNA repair deficits I think would be very interesting. Um, this is a very fascinating area that I think we will have more and more um, focused hypotheses on.